This is one fact from every year of Apple. You've probably heard of Apple's two co-founders, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. But back in 1976, there was actually another guy. Ronald Wayne held 10% of Apple's initial shares for just 12 days, a stake that would be worth over $200 billion today. On the 3rd of January 1977, Apple Inc. was incorporated after receiving funding from an angel investor that would go on to take over a third of the new company's shares. By this time, Steve Wozniak was already working on Apple's second computer, which they'd go on to release later that year. By 1978, the Apple II was considered one of the Trinity computers that essentially founded the home computer market that we know today. This was a massive year for Apple, where not only would the Apple II hit $7.8 million worth of sales, but they'd also go on to release their first ever storage accessory, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive named the Disk 2. While the Apple II was in the top three personal computers, it was a distant third until something amazing happened in 1979. The Apple II was chosen to be the desktop platform for VisiCalc, a spreadsheet software that completely changed the way people would use personal computers. No longer were these computers just for hobbyists, this gave them a legitimate business use. And the catch was, you could only get it on the Apple II. There have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra walked into my office at Apple one day and said, I, I have this incredible new program, I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really propelled the Apple II to the success it, it achieved. In 1980, Apple generated over $101 million, but not by selling products. On the 12th of December, Apple became a public company, creating 300 millionaires in the process. But by 1981, it seemed like Apple's luck might just have been starting to run out. IBM, a massive manufacturer of large scientific and business computers, noticed how well companies like Apple, Commodore, and Tandy Corporation were doing, and they wanted a slice. So IBM released the IBM PC. IBM made its personal computer to help a person be more productive, to help a person be more creative. And those are good reasons for a person to feel good. The IBM personal computer. Despite that, in 1982, Apple still managed to grow their business by 74%, to a whopping $583 million in net sales. But in 1983, it all changed. Steve Wozniak, Apple's co-founder, decided to leave. This led to the hiring of Pepsi CEO John Scully, after Steve Jobs asked him the famous question, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or come with me and change the world? In 1984, Apple released its iconic 1984 Super Bowl commercial that introduced the world to the first Macintosh. We shall prevail. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. The ad alluded to a dystopian world in which one entity has complete control. Many assumed the entity Apple was talking about was IBM, who by this point had more than double their annual sales and over 56% of the corporate market share. While the ad was a complete success, by 1985 the Macintosh had completely failed to defeat IBM, leading to a power struggle between Apple's CEO John Scully and Steve Jobs. Jobs planned to oust him from the top job, but the board ended up voting against him and removed him as the head of the Macintosh. Macintosh division. Having no control over Apple's direction, he resigned and sold all but one of his 6.5 million shares in the company. In 1986, Scully sought to fix a massive issue with Apple, the separation between the Apple II team and the Macintosh team. Up until that point, each department was almost working as its own individual business due to a disagreement between Jobs and Scully on what kind of computer the company should be focusing on. In 1987, Apple upgraded the Macintosh to the Macintosh II, and while it could never really compete with the IBM PC, it survived throughout the early years off the back of desktop publishing. The combination of Apple's own laser printer, the Macintosh, and the program PageMaker allowed small businesses to do all their own publishing, and that kept the Macintosh alive. The, the second really big explosion in our, our industry has been desktop publishing. People could start to do on their desktops things that only typesetters and printers could do prior to that, and that's been a very big revolution in publishing. After the release of Windows 2.0 in 1988, Scully was shocked by how similar Microsoft software was to Apple's. So they sued them in the federal court over 189 elements that they claimed breached their copyright. As you can imagine, that significantly strained their existing business relationship. Moving on to 1989, Apple released the first ever battery-powered Mac, 
the Macintosh Portable with its built-in trackball for navigation. Although it didn't sell too well with its hefty price tag, battery issues and display problems, it did establish what would become today's MacBooks. But it didn't stop there. 1989, the Mac Portable. 1990, the Mac Classic and the Mac LC. 1991, the Mac Quandra and the PowerBook. 1992, the Mac Centris and the Mac Performer. Ah! So many models! Is exactly how consumers felt. While each of these models made improvements in their own ways, by the early 90s it was incredibly difficult for regular people to know which one to actually buy. This led to an oversupply of some models that they couldn't sell, and a massive amount of orders for others that they just couldn't deliver. Apple was losing its reputation for simplicity, but rather than refocusing on its core products to solve that problem, they expanded into new markets. And so in 1993, Apple releases the Newton, a personal digital assistant. Basically the notes, calendar and reminders app on your phone today is everything that this wished it could have been. In theory, it allowed users to transform written notes into text and do other things like schedule meetings. But unfortunately it struggled with handwriting recognition and so left people with a pretty frustrating experience. And then keeping with the trend of jumping into new markets, in 1994, Apple releases a digital camera called the QuickTake. This is one of the first few digital cameras ever sold to US consumers, which is kind of crazy to think about. In 1995, under a new CEO that was introduced a couple of years before, they did something that I don't think you'd ever see them do today. They started licensing Mac OS, their operating system, to other manufacturers, leading to the rise of clone Toshes or non-genuine Macs. While in theory, yeah, sure, they earned licensing revenue from this, what actually ended up happening is that these clone Toshes just cannibalized the sales of their Mac line. In 1996, the Apple board of directors once again voted out the CEO, this time bringing in Gil Emilio, who's credited with doing one thing in particular, acquiring Steve Jobs' next company, Next, and therefore bringing him back to Apple. In 1997, Emilio was ousted as the CEO and Steve Jobs stepped in as an interim CEO, or as he called it, an iCEO. And one of the first big changes he made was to rekindle their relationship with Microsoft. He did this by addressing the negative idea that for Apple to win, Microsoft had to lose, and went so far as to have Bill Gates be a part of the 1997 Macworld Expo. 1998 was the year where Apple introduced Mac OS X and asked the world to say hello to the iMac. If anything shows Steve Jobs' genius, it was the iMac, as it quickly became Apple's best-selling Mac of all time, growing their market share by over 10%. In 1999, the world got their first taste of Steve Jobs' famous line, there's one more thing. So thank you for coming today and checking this out with us. We're very, very pleased to introduce this to you. And, uh, oh, wait a minute now. Uh, there is one more thing. There is one more thing. This would be the start of a tradition that would continue for years to come. There is one more thing. But there's one more thing. There is one more thing. There is one more thing. By 2000, the board voted to remove the interim title and once again make him the CEO of Apple. I'm pleased to announce today that I'm going to drop the interim title. But he wasn't just the CEO of Apple. The whole time he was the interim CEO at Apple, he was also the CEO of Pixar, the animation studio famous for films like Toy Story. 2001 was a massive year for Apple. In the same year that they launched their first ever retail store, they also announced the iPod. The iPod would become one of Apple's flagship products of the mid-2000s and completely dominate the digital music player market in the US. But they didn't stop innovating. 2002 was the year where the iMac changed completely. Wait till you meet the new iMac. This iMac replaced the famous colourful iMacs released just four years earlier, and is the first generation of the flat iMacs that we still see today. In 2003, the iTunes Store was announced, the result of Steve Jobs pushing for a digital music store after spotting a gap in the market that paired perfectly with the iPod. At the time of release, iTunes allowed users to purchase over 200,000 songs at only 99 cents each. It really was the first step towards the digital streaming platforms that we know today, and it would become the largest music music vendor in the US by 2008. And 2004 was another year of expansion for iTunes, expanding to global markets like the UK, 
France, and Germany. And by December, they'd sell their 200 millionth song. Alongside the explosion of iTunes in 2005, they also saw their iPod sales skyrocket. I mean, in the second quarter of 2005, Apple sold 5.3 million iPods, representing a 558% increase in quarterly sales. This was around the time we were getting new iPods and ads like this. Now, you probably know what's coming in 2007, but first 2006, the year that Apple completely transitioned their Mac line to Intel processors. And now the year that changed it all, 2007, the introduction of a new kind of device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. And by the next year, 2008, the iPhone reached 1.1% of the worldwide phone market and 8.2% of the smartphone market. But 2008 wasn't just about the iPhone. This was the year that Apple released the MacBook Air, the world's thinnest notebook. This is the new MacBook Air and you can get a feel for how thin it is. In 2009, we were already three generations into the iPhone, and by this point, it ranked second for US smartphone market share behind the BlackBerry. This was the year that we got the iPhone 3GS and sales began to skyrocket. It was twice as fast as the previous 3G, and it was the first time that Apple ever shipped an iPhone with a camera. Introducing the next iPhone. It's the iPhone you love. Now with video just one of the amazing new features on the iPhone 3GS. 2010 was the year of the iPad. What's interesting is that Apple initially feared that the iPad line would cannibalize their Mac sales, but the reverse actually ended up being true. In the 2010 holiday season, Apple sold 23% more Macs while simultaneously selling 7.3 million iPads. And that brings us to August 24, 2011, when Steve Jobs addressed a letter to the board of Apple that read, I've always said that if there ever came a day when I could no longer meet my duties and expectations as Apple's CEO, I would be the first to let you know. Unfortunately, that day has come. Steve Jobs lost his life to pancreatic cancer just a little over a month later. And so 2012 was the first year under the new leadership of Tim Cook. They continued with yearly iPhone launches, but what was most interesting about this year was the announcement of a $10 billion share buyback scheme. In 2013, this scheme where Apple essentially asked shareholders to sell their shares back to Apple was expanded to a total payout of $100 billion over two years. And now 2014 marked the first time that Apple introduced a new product line after the death of Steve Jobs. It also marked the first time that Tim Cook ever used the classic line, there's one more thing. We have one more thing. And another signature one more thing came with the announcement of Apple Music in 2015. Apple Music launched in 100 countries and offered a three month free trial. The problem was that Apple's policy was not to pay artists for their songs streamed during those three months. Thankfully, after Taylor Swift brought attention to the issue, it was swiftly resolved. In 2016, the FBI asked Apple to provide a way for the government to disable security features on iPhones. They essentially asked for a government backdoor to unlock iPhones and extract criminals' data. Apple, to their credit, stuck by their privacy policy and refused, and the resulting legal case was eventually dropped. 2017 was the year of Face ID. This time, Apple's One More Thing was a complete redesign of the iPhone. While they still released the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, the iPhone 10 was a clear indication of where the iPhone 
iPhone line would go in the future. In 2018, Apple was in the peak of dealing with battery gate, a controversy around purposefully slowing down people's phones. Apple explained that as batteries age, they're unable to provide the same levels of peak current, causing devices to unexpectedly shut down. To prevent this, Apple secretly slowed phones with software fixes, leading to a number of lawsuits and the introduction of a discounted battery replacement program. In August 2019, Apple released the Apple Card in partnership with Goldman Sachs. It didn't go without some controversy, however, as people were wondering whether Goldman Sachs was offering men a higher credit limit than women. Especially after Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple said that he received a higher credit limit than his wife. But in the end, the New York State Department of Financial Services found that there was no unlawful discrimination. 2020 brought the introduction of Apple's M1 chips, their own proprietary silicon. These machines saw a massive spike in performance, especially when compared to previous years. In 2021, we got a ruling on the Epic Games lawsuit, where Epic bypassed Apple's 30% commission by introducing a new payment method in the game Fortnite. Apple won on 9 out of 10 counts, but the negative PR led them to reduce their commission to 15% for smaller developers. 2022 brought the introduction of an always-on display and a new 800 US dollar Apple Watch Ultra. As for 2023, well, in the first quarter, Apple's already done over $100 billion worth of sales, and the company's worth over $2.5 trillion. Thanks for watching.